Hi everyone, I'm Chris Tisdale and I'm a mathematician at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And I'm really excited to be bringing you this presentation on recent research in mathematics. Now the aims of these kinds of presentations are as follows. Firstly, to freely and openly share recent research discoveries in mathematics with the world. Secondly, to increase the impact and the awareness of the research involved. Thirdly, to stimulate further research into the areas of interest. And finally, to foster connections with the worldwide research community. Now, the potential audiences for these kinds of presentations uh, ranges from advanced undergraduates through to career researchers. Now, this includes honours, masters and PhD students, postdocs uh, and professors. I hope you enjoy this presentation. I hope you find it interesting, engaging and useful. Hi, everyone. In this presentation, I'm going to discuss some recent uh, research discoveries of mine. And in particular, I'm going to talk about general Gronwall inequalities with some applications to so-called fractional differential equations of arbitrary order. Now, some of these applications will include the following, so-called a priori bounds on solutions and also um, some non-multiplicity results, which are kind of like um, uniqueness of solutions, very loosely speaking. Now, a um, recurring theme throughout this presentation is the use of the so-called Mittag-Leffler function. Okay, well, the general problem that we're going to look at is here, this is a, a general initial value problem. The Q here is um, the order of this general differential equation. And in particular, the Q here could be a whole number or it could be a fraction. Okay, hence the word fraction or differential equations. Now, the, um, let's say if Q equals one, then the Oper operator dq is just the regular derivative or differential operator from a first course in calculus. So this equation 1.1 is, is kind of like a generalized differential equation of arbitrary order. Now the right hand side f is assumed to be continuous throughout and it could be nonlinear. Now you'll see in 1.2 that um, this general differential equation is coupled with some initial um, data or initial conditions um, where the, uh, uh, this um, notation here um, is the ceiling function of Q. So, for example, if Q equals 1, essentially what happens is this disappears, all these disappear, and you just get a regular initial value problem. Now, the T sub um, ceiling Q minus 1, this represents the Maclaurin polynomial of order or degree uh, ceiling Q minus 1. Okay, and the AIs are all constants. Now, um, the DQ is known as the Riemann Louisville fractional differentiation operator. Um, I'm not going to give a full uh, definition just yet, I'll give one a little bit later, but just, just, so just think of this DQ as. Um, uh, as a uh, general differential operator. Now, if you're having a hard time seeing all these subscripts, then make sure you're watching this presentation in high definition. Okay, so the first part of this presentation is um, forming general Gronwall's inequalities and then relating them back to solutions to this general problem. So um, essentially, Gronwall's inequality is, is rather abstract, but um, what we'll do is form some and then show how you can apply the ideas to um, solutions of this problem here. Okay, well, um, sometimes in this presentation I'll use the following uh, 
notation with this sort of superscript C here. Now, um, this is defined as the Caputo derivative. Okay, and um, you may be looking at this and going, okay, Chris, I've got a possible fractional differential equation in 1.1, but then the initial conditions involve um, uh, just regular derivatives. Well, in Caputo's paper, um, Caputo argued that actually having these regular derivatives as the initial conditions is more realistic and actually it improves accuracy in modeling our phenomena. Um, so that's why we, we, we've discussed them and, and put those in as 1.2. Okay, so like I said, um, this presentation is about uh, general versions of Gronel's inequality. And um, some of those are taken from a forthcoming research paper of mine. Um, and we're also going to look at the applications of these inequalities to solutions of this problem. And in particular, we'll form what's known as a priori bounds on solutions to this problem. And also, we'll obtain non-multiplicity, which it's kind of like uniqueness. As I said in the abstract, one of the guiding principles has been to incorporate um, uh, nice elements of this special function known as the mittag leffler function. And even though the mittag leffler function is 100 years old, um, I believe it still has a lot of potential to uncover um, qualitative, um, an, uh, qualitative properties of solutions to this kind of problem. And here are some references. Now, um, the, when you see a reference here, uh, they're all in the references at the end. So I'll show you them at the end of the presentation. Okay, well, to understand um, the notation and to keep this presentation somewhat self-contained, I'm going to introduce um, a few definitions and some notations in, the, in, in this section. Okay, well, we define the riemann lewy rule fractional derivative and fractional integral of order q of a function y defined respectively here and here. Okay, and like I said before, the Caputo derivative is just a sort of like a shorthand way of writing this. Now, what do we mean when we speak of a solution to this initial, generalized initial value problem? Well, we mean a function x defined on, on some interval, such that the graph of the function lies in the domain of f, and x satisfies uh, both the generalized differential equation and, of course, the initial data or the initial conditions. Now, instead of directly dealing with these um, problems here, a common technique in the study of differential equations is to use an equivalent integral equation. So this lemma here is going to be a fundamental part of this work. And um, if you want the proof, you can see it in Kil Kilbass's et al's uh, book. I'm not going to list it here. If f is a continuous function, then the initial value problem 1.1, 1.2 is equivalent to the following integral equation. So this um, integral equation is going to be of a, a more useful, a more tractable uh, nature. So we're going to work with this in, in many cases. Now, I mentioned before that much of the methods in this presentation involves a special function called the mittag leffler function. So I just wanted to um, briefly give you the function. So the mittag leffler function of order q is defined and denoted by uh, this um, function here. Now, this converges for all uh, complex numbers, but will be particularly interested in this general form. Okay, so um, essentially I've just replaced z with uh, beta tq, where beta is a positive constant, and t is, some, uh, is um, from this interval here. Now, you can think of, of this mittag leffler function as sort of playing a similar role 
as the exponential function. So for example, um, if q equals 1, then this just becomes the following. It's just the regular exponential to the beta t. Okay, now, another very important property in the context of this work is that this particular function is the unique solution to this general linear initial value problem. And we'll use that in some of the, um, some of the working. Okay, well, let's move on to the next section. I guess this is um, the main results of this presentation uh, contained in this section here. So in this section, some basic um, integral, uh, sorry, some basic integral inequalities are going to be formulated that ensure bounds on the functions involved. And in particular, the bounds are going to be in terms of this mittag leffler function. Now, um, for the case when q equals 1, there are some very famous um, Gronwall type inequalities in these papers here. Okay, and um, for the case q not equal to 1, I guess some of the results in this section may be considered as analogues, more general um, generalizations, I guess, of the famous results in these publications. Okay, well, the, f the first result I'm going to give you is actually a minor variation of a result of D. Tellerman Ford's. Now, let's have a look. This is actually published in my forthcoming paper, but like I said before, it's, it's very similar to um, D. Tellerman's and Ford's. Let A, B, and C be non negative constants, and let rho be some continuous function that's non-negative. If this integral inequality is satisfied on this interval, then on the same interval, rho satisfies the following inequality. Okay, well, it's very easy uh, to, to prove the case when b equals zero. If b equals zero, then that term disappears, and you can integrate this directly. So you, you can come up with that. But the, um, the more interesting case is the case when B is positive. So let's talk about the proof here. Now the proof for this um, case follows very closely the, uh, the, the proof of Detelms and Fords. Okay, well, I'm going to def define a, um, a function here, phi, defined in this way, where epsilon is, is uh, any positive um, value. Now, you can see that actually this and this is almost the same, except you've got an extra term of epsilon times this in here. What we're going to do is actually show that rho is strictly less than this function phi on the interval, and, that, uh, and we're going to show that that's true for all epsilon greater than zero. And so we can actually come up with a, um, a less than or equals to and remove the epsilon. So that's the idea of the proof. Okay, well, this function is the solution to this uh, integral equation here. Now, you can see from 3.1, phi of 0 is less than or equal to a. And from 3.3, uh, sorry, rho of 0 is less than or equal to a from 3.1. And you can see from 3.3, phi of 0 equals a plus epsilon. So we know that phi of 0 is strictly, uh, sorry, rho of 0 is strictly less than phi of 0. And we, we claim, and when I say we, I mean um, myself and the viewer, we claim that rho is strictly less than phi on this interval. Okay, well, let's argue by contradiction. Assume there's a point where this isn't true, somewhere in the interval. Okay, some point T1. Now, essentially what we're going to do here is use an application of the intermediate value theorem. Okay, so let's say this is um, my phi. Okay, and 
here, but, uh, I know any function rho must start below the graph, and we're assuming that there's some t1 where phi of t, uh, sorry, where rho of t1 is greater than or equal to phi of t1. So you know we have to connect these two points somewhere. Now both phi and rho are continuous functions, so we know that these two curves have got to cross at some point. Okay, by the intermediate value theorem, because we've assumed that um, they're continuous functions. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, since this is true, I know that uh, t sub naught must be greater than zero, and um, the t sub naught must be less than or equal to t sub one. Okay, so essentially we can come up with the following. We know that on this interval, phi is below, uh, sorry, rho is below phi, and then they, they touch at some point. Okay, well, we have the following inequality on 0 to t sub naught, and what we can do is just test this at t, at t equals t sub naught, so I get this, and then using this inequality I can form another inequality here, and this is strictly less than this, but this is our definition of phi of t sub naught. So what does this tell us? It tells us that at t naught, rho of t naught is strictly less than phi of t naught. Well that actually is a contradiction because we have this. So what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that this can't occur, so we must have this on the entire interval. So we have a strict inequality, and because this holds for all positive values of epsilon, then we can actually just remove this epsilon out of this bracket and form a, a, a weak inequality there. And like I said before, the case B equals zero is very easy. So that's a basic um, example, uh, sorry, a basic um, um, illustration of how you can use the intermediate value theorem to prove a, a nice new result like this. Now you can see that one of the um, conditions in the lemma was that our row is continuous. Okay? Now, if we relax that condition, then we'd have to change the proof because we use the intermediate value theorem, and the intermediate value theorem demands that we have, uh, use continuous functions. So the next result is a generalization. So let a, b, and c be non negative constants, and let rho be non, a function that's non negative, but all we're assuming here is that it's piecewise continuous. Now, under the same inequality as lemma 3.1, then rho satisfies the following inequality. Okay, well, the inequality in lemma 3.2 isn't quite as pretty as this. Uh, this is very nice because, for example, if q equals 1, then these, these um, functions on the right-hand side reduce to the famous ones, for example, in... Reed's book on ordinary differential equations. But this is still um, uh, interesting and still useful. And like I said, it's a, it's a genuine um, generalization because all we've assumed here on our row is that it's piecewise continuous. Now the, um, the method of proof is different to the, previous, the proof of the previous lemma. Um, if b equals zero, then you can, I mean, this is just going to become one and you get uh, you can come up with the, the bound um, in a direct way. So let's discuss the case when b is positive. Okay, well, the case when b is positive, we need a, a fundamental um, identity of fractional calculus uh, from this publication here, namely the following. Okay, so we'll use that in our proof. Okay, well, what we're going to do is play with the integrand here in the following way. 
So okay, well from 3.5 we have the following. And what I've done is I've inserted these mittag leffler functions into the integrand. And I've just sort of integrated the C directly. Now what I can do is take this, um, uh, you, I can take the supremum of this and move it out the front and form an inequality. Okay, the uh, row is uh, piecewise continuous, so it, so it has a supremum. And then I'm left with this. Okay, well, this is just the Caputo derivative of this. And so what I've actually what I have here is like a, the integral of a Caputo derivative. So using this, I can come up with the following. It's just this minus this. Now, for this uh, this particular function, you see that actually the b's cancel here. So for this particular function, um, the Taylor polynomial, oh, the Maclaurin polynomial, is the following. Well. The coefficients when i equals 1 is 1, and all the other coefficients are 0. So actually, this minus this is just this minus this. Okay, so I have the following. Well, what I'm going to do then is just divide both sides by the mittag leffler function. And then what, what I can do is take suprema everywhere. So I'll, I'll get the following. And then I can just rearrange this. Okay, so if I take this up to the right hand side, I'll get the following. And of course, this is always greater than or equal to rho on this mittag leffler function. And so I come up with the following. So, so then you can just rearrange that and get the original 3.6. Okay, and in the case of b equals 0, again, you can just integrate this directly. Okay, so um, this is um, a slightly more general result than lemma 3.1 and the method of proof is different and it really um, is, in, I believe, involves this mittag leffler function in a nice way. Now the this, this sort of um, right hand side is not quite as pretty as um, the one in lemma 3.1 but I, I think it's interesting nonetheless. Okay, so there's some, some general Gronwall inequalities. The following two theorems uh, are going to be used to gather some qualitative information about the solutions to the original um, fractional uh, initial value problem, 1.1, 1.2. Let k and k1 be non-negative constants. If x has a continuous derivative of order q and the, deriv the Caputo derivative satisfies this kind of inequality on this interval, then the function x satisfies the following inequality. Okay, so the basic idea is just to um, show that the conditions of lemma 3.1 are satisfied. So let's start with this and move to an inequality here. And then um, I can form this relationship just through the fundamental theorem, which is just this. And now if I take these absolute values inside and apply inequality 3.9, I come up with the following. So if I move this to the other side, I should get the following. And so you, know, you can see now that lemma 3.1 holds with rho, just the absolute value of x, a equals this, b equals this, and c equals this. Okay, so from lemma 3.1 we get these, this right hand side here. Okay, well here's an, an application of um, lemma 3.2. Very similar to the previous one except the only change is that 
we're assuming x has a piecewise continuous derivative of order q. Okay, so the same inequality here, different right-hand side here, but again, it's just uh, the, the proof is very similar to to what we did here, except um, you're just applying um, lemma 3.2 here with rho equals that, a equals that, b equals that, and c equals that. Okay, well, I um, promised that there would be some applications here to fractional differential equations. So let's define the following infinite strip as the domain of little f in our original fractional differential equation 1.1, 1.2. So, you know, the domain of f is something like this, this infinite strip. Okay, well, the following theorem gives what's known as an a priori bound on all solutions to the original um, in this general initial value problem, 1.1, 1.2. Let k and k1 be non-negative constants and let f be continuous. If f satisfies this kind of, I guess, linear growth condition in the second variable, then all possible solutions x to our general initial value problem on the interval 0 to little a satisfy this a priori bound. And before we discuss the proof, let's talk about why that's um, important. Now, a priori bounds, um, uh, 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 I guess, a priori bounds are geometric properties of solutions. Okay, now we may have uh, an initial value problem that's highly nonlinear, very difficult to solve, and we, we can't actually extract the solution. Now, what this information gives us is some sort of um, bound on every possible solution. So we have some sort of um, geometric understanding of where the, any possible solutions will, will lie. Also, all of these constants here, the a sub i's, the, the little a's, the k1, the k2, are all known. Okay, so if we're given a specific problem, then we'll be able to determine this right-hand side. Another reason for obtaining a priori bounds on um, solutions to uh, you know, generalised differential equations is that this is, in many cases, the first step to forming a new existence theory. Um, that's not the subject of this particular presentation, but um, it, it's very, very important. Okay, so how do we prove this? Well. Let x be any solution to our original general initial value problem, and x is continuous. And essentially we're going to show that the conditions of theorem 3.3 hold. So essentially we just want to show that this holds here for some positive or uh, non-negative constants k and k1. So how do we do it? Well, we can start with the fractional differential equation, dq of this equals f, take absolute values of both sides and then move from this inequality to this inequality by just using assumption 4.1. So certainly 3.9 holds now and um, this bound here is just from here and of course, this is going to be less. You can replace t with a. Okay, these are all increasing functions. So, um, this is where you get the a's in here from. As another um, application, consider the following: that f be continuous if there exists a positive constant l such that f satisfies this inequality on the strip, then the general initial value problem 1.1, 1.2 has at most one solution. So that means that the conclusion is there's either one solution or no solution at all.
So why is that important? Well, from a practical point of view, let's say you could um, produce a solution to a, a, a potentially difficult problem. If the satisfied, then you know the solution that you've produced must be the only solution. So there is some practical um, importance to it. This condition here, 4.3, is a very famous condition known as a Lipschitz condition. Okay, well how do we prove it? Well, suppose X and Y are two solutions to 1.1, 1.2. We show that actually X and Y have to be one and the same solution. So using lemma 2.1, we can write X and Y in, term, uh, you know, um, in their integral forms and then take one away from the other and put in absolute values. So from here to here, we've employed 4.3. And actually, you can see now that this is kind of like a Gronwall inequality. If we let rho equal the absolute x minus y. Okay, so I've chosen to apply lemma 3.2 there. But you could, of course, choose lemma 3.1 as well. Now... If we apply lemma 3.2 with these values, then you'll actually see that rho must be less than or equal to zero. So we're in the, at the sort of stage where this has got to be non-negative, and this tells us it's not positive. So the only explanation there is that rho must be zero. So if rho is zero, then x and y must be identical. So we, what we can conclude is that the general initial value problem, 1.1, 1.2, has at most one solution. Well, there are some applications to um, some fractional differential equations. Uh, I must say theorem 4.1 and theorem 4.2 um, are well known. But I think um, it's very interesting still to see how you can apply these general Gronwall um, inequalities and related results to these, to these problems. Okay, well here's um, an example to give you some more concreteness on um, these theorems. Consider this f here. This is nonlinear, it's continuous in, in uh, every strip. And the claim is that this f satisfies the conditions of theorem 4.1 and theorem 4.2. So um, if we can show that, then we know that the associated initial value problem with this right hand side has an a priori bound on all solutions and has at most one solution. So essentially all we're going to do is go through and show that there is a k and a k1 that this, such that this is satisfied on the strip and we're also going to show that there is a positive number L such that this is satisfied for all points in the strip. Okay, so f is continuous, um, we can put absolute values here and then form the following inequality. So you can hopefully see that 4.1 holds then with big K equals 1 and K sub 1 equals A plus 1. Well, for the conditions of theorem 4.2, we need an L such that this holds in the strip. To do that, that's a little trickier, but to do that, what we're going to do is um, show that our F has a continuous and uniformly bounded derivative with respect to the second variable. Now this is um, well known to ensure that a Lipschitz condition will hold. Okay, So let's just differentiate this with respect to P to get this. We see that this is actually bounded by positive 1. And it turns out that I can use that positive 1 as my Lipschitz constant, so to speak, this L here. Okay, So if I can bound it, I can use it as, as my L. Thus, the conditions of theorem 4.2 are satisfied, so the initial value problem associated with this has at most one solution. Now you may be thinking the two conditions here and here, are they related somehow? Well, let me put it like this. If this holds, then this holds. All you need to do is replace V with zero here and you can rearrange and get this. But if this holds, this may not necessarily hold. So this Lipschitz condition is a stronger condition than this. Okay, well, 
here's some further reading for you. This is my forthcoming paper. Uh, I'll put a link to the journal in the um, description. And here are the references that I've referred to um, in the text. Now, there are some there that I haven't referred to, but they're still very good um, reads and associated with the presentation in some way. So you can think of the ones that I haven't referred to as um, uh, additional reading. So I'll just show them to uh, show you the lists um, one by one. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, please look out for more research-inspired presentations in the future.